The struggle between the right and the left is central to almost every country in the West right now. It's so central, in fact, that it often shocks me. Really, we're arguing over what to call Christmas or transgender bathrooms when climate change could make Florida sink or China's trying to take over Asia. However, once you dig a little, you find that rather than just being a political conflict, the struggle between the right and the left is central to modern Western civilization, with ideological roots going back thousands of years, and with whichever side wins being decisive for the future. This video will look at why and how the right and the left are different and why they dislike each other so much, what they represent in society and what it means. This video will look at four ways the right and the left are different and how they clash. You know, I've said it before on this channel plenty of times and I'm going to say it again here, but our minds are inherently self-serving and irrational. We ignore information we don't like. Social media algorithms have figured out how to take advantage of this. They push us down rabbit holes that reinforce our beliefs about the world, which might feel good, but it's not good for us. But what if there's a way out of the rabbit hole? Ground News is an app for anyone looking to escape the perpetual culture wars between the right and the left. It lets you easily compare how a story is being covered by sources across the political spectrum. And unlike social media and other news aggregators, Ground doesn't use your browsing history to manipulate the news you see. In fact, they go out of their way to show you stories you might be missing. The blind spot feature highlights key issues that aren't being reported by the right or the left. Founded by a former NASA engineer, Ground News empowers you with objective data and easy-to-use tools so you can compare news coverage and draw your own conclusions. If you're the kind of person who likes having their worldview challenged and seeing all sides of an issue like I'm sure you all do, then Ground News is for you. Click the link in the description to download the free Ground News app today. The main determining factor here is that the right and the left care about fundamentally different values. Very smart social psychologist John Haidt did scientific studies that found that there are six fundamental human values that we all share. However, when looking at different political positions, he found that conservatives, libertarians, and progressives put extremely different emphases on these different values. For a summary, these values are harm, which says that hurting others is bad, fairness or that people should reap what they sow, liberty or that people shouldn't oppress their social inferiors, loyalty which is self-explanatory, respect for authority, and purity or that certain things are sacred and can't be violated. Progressives are extremely high in the value harm. This is why left-wingers will say, children are starving in Africa, how can we do nothing? Afterwards, progressives are interested in liberty or caring about if people are oppressed by unfair hierarchies, which is a lot of where their emphasis on helping oppressed groups comes from. Liberals also care a certain degree about fairness. However, after that, liberals don't care about any of the other values. Conservatives, however, are pretty well balancing all six values, with high emphasis on authority, loyalty, maintaining moral purity, harm, and liberty. Conservatives are more similar to the rest of history in the world. In non-Western societies, for example, people are higher in authority, loyalty, and purity. Progressives are more so the far extension of the West's greater emphasis on harm and liberty that started during the Middle Ages. Libertarians are interesting in that they, like progressives, are mostly focused on a handful of values that ignore the rest, but they're super strong in liberty and fairness, which is why libertarians want as little government as possible and are fine with prostitution, marijuana, and guns. An interesting thing is that the social justice wing of the left has picked up a new attribute, extremely high purity, in which saying the wrong words, misappropriating, and the like is treated as an attack on the sanctity of their movement. Something I want to make clear is that all these values are fundamentally irrational, and each political position has rational arguments that can be used to justify it. We don't choose our politics based off rational decisions. They're given to us by a combination of genetics, upbringing, and a little bit of rationality on our part. It's entirely fine that morality is mostly irrational. Take, for example, that on a purely rational basis, consensual cannibalism or incest with good contraception is totally fine, but most of us would just say it can be disgusted by those. On an entirely rational basis, you could justify the Nazis, since if you start with the Darwinistic assumption that spreading your genes is the most important thing, and people of your ethnic group have similar genes to you, then wiping out other groups that gives your group and your family more breeding abilities and population potential, as most animals do do, is entirely justified. The position that genociding people outside of your group is morally bad comes from a belief in the individual soul and that human life is value in general, something which came out of traditional religions, and it's why you saw so much genocide in the ancient world. The Assyrians didn't care when they depopulated entire regions. 
Another way of viewing it is that your side's frame of logic might not be the other side's. For example, a progressive might think that a conservative's insistence upon national honor is inherently irrational, but in real terms, nations that appear weak in the world stage are attacked more since they look like they're easy pickings. For conservatives, the Vietnam War made total sense if America was seen to not be protecting its allies, then other American allies would be attacked, thus making the cost worthwhile. For progressives, it was a war of colonial oppression in a useless country that American boys would die in. Similarly, conservatives often view left-wing social spending on stuff like education and social programs as idiotic, given they have no direct economic output, but realistically, education is the best predictor there is out there of economic success. Income inequality, which conservatives either ignore or laud, is an amazing predictor for a series of negative effects that end up hurting the U.S. economy like crime, single-parent households, lack of social mobility, and the like. In summary, the world's a complicated place and we should do more listening and less talking. This explains why when conservatives, progressives, or libertarians argue with the other, their arguments often fall on deaf ears. A progressive might argue for gay rights since it's a representation of their harm and liberty functions to help the oppressed, while a religious conservative coming from a Christian background would view it as an attack upon the Christianity that has held their civilization together for 2,000 years through a purity function. The big thing you need to understand of the modern left-right binary is that it's a way of figuring out the trajectory of Western civilization in a post-Christian world. For 2,000 years, morality and ethics were relatively easy since one just referenced the Bible. The reason that the fight between the right and the left is so contentious is that at heart it's a religious war, and that both sides have what amounts to entire metaphysical views about how the world works and what the direction of Western civilization should be going forward. First of all, I'm using religion here to describe a comprehensive ideology that tells people how the world works, how they can be good people, creates a community of believers, and provides ceremonies. God doesn't have to be involved. Take Buddhism or Confucianism that are at heart atheist. Or look at communism in which the certain dialectic of history acts exactly as a god would. Nazism, communism, Christianity, and the like all fulfill the exact same role inside our heads, and so I classify them as the same. In America and in most of Europe, the dominant parties are both fundamentally liberal, and that their predominant presupposition is that individual rights and the collective well-being is good and should be the dominant aim of society. However, the problem with liberalism or the idea that the ultimate aim of society should be individual rights is that it doesn't deal with any of the other aims of religion. It doesn't tell you how to be a good person, build communities, or deal with the heartbreak of death, childbirth, and the like. Liberalism was an extension of a pre-existing Christian civilization whose foundations it depended upon. To be brutally honest, the idea that the individual was the fundamental element of society comes from Christianity, which presupposes the existence of a soul that creates a value for human life. Alongside Catholicism, which broke up clans by banning cousin marriage, thus making the West the most individualistic civilization in history. The decline in Christianity has also seen the decline in traditional liberalism wherever it's happened, whether in the West after the World Wars with the rise of nanny states and decline in free market capitalism, or with the rise of leftist ideology, or with the rise of atheist ideologies like Nazism and Stalinism that happened after World War I, or with the general weakness of liberal regimes in places like Japan and India that aren't Christian. The reason that conservatives are an alliance between the religious and business interests is that the structure of Protestantism allows more active free market capitalism since once you remove the idea of heaven, envy in society becomes impossible to control. Which is why as societies have become less and less Christian, free market capitalism declines and socialist tendencies have increased. The left takes the fundamental understanding of Christianity as Jesus taught it, that humans are inherently good and that we just need to spread love and generosity in order to be in the kingdom of heaven. This view was doubled down through the frame of Greek philosophy, since the Gospels were written in Greek, which believes that humans were largely inherently good and rational, and that people were capable of perfectibility through rational thinking. The right was part of the Augustinian worldview that came out of Persian religions like Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism, which held that the world was a battle between good and evil, and that people had to fight against their own inherent evil and greed. The structure of Christianity existed as a bulwark against people who were born in original sin. This was a view that was propounded by St. Augustine and became dominant across the medieval Catholic Church. The right's view of a sinful and constrained humanity is generally that of medieval Christianity, while the left's view of humanity being perfectible through logic and improvement is a view that came through the Renaissance and has grown larger across modern history. Interestingly enough, the belief that humans are inherently self-interested allows the right-wingers to deal with their ideological opponents more easily than the left, which views their opponents as inherently evil. For leftists that believe that perfecting the human character is possible, being against their goals means you're trying to hold back progress. 
This is historically why you've seen a greater degree of fanaticism on the left, or why leftist groups often succumb to radicalism or infighting. The belief in perfectibility is also why left-wingers often succumb to guilt, since they judge themselves against abstract standards rather than a real-world example, and so don't measure up to perfection. These evolved into the two visions of the world described by American economist Thomas Sowell of the constrained and unconstrained visions of the world. The unconstrained vision, or that that the left holds, is that people are inherently perfectible and naturally good and that if there's a problem in the world, it has to be someone's fault, given that human nature and the world is naturally good and fair. This is why when there's a disparity in something like income range between ethnic groups or between genders and the like, left-wingers look for an oppressive group like the patriarchy or racism, since in their worldview, unfairness and inequality are the exception, not the norm. Since left-wingers think that people are naturally good and perfectible, and the world's able to be improved through conscious reforms, that people who are cultivated and educated and sincere, which often ends up being intellectuals, are capable of making real progress in the world and improving the human race to reform. A racist joke is slowing down the perfection of the human race, which will solve the rest of the problems. Human beings are in control of the world, and thus by perfecting humanity, we are perfecting the ability to deal with other broader problems in the world. However, on the right, which believes that human nature is inherently self-interested, if not evil, society exists in order to keep back our inherent moral weakness. They don't believe human nature is perfectible, and rather that existence is a permanent battle against the forces of evil and chaos, and that we need processes and organizations like religion, property rights, and capitalism to hold back the demons inside the human spirit. They believe that we're permanently on the precipice of a dark age and that we need to fight evil foreign powers which will otherwise pull us backwards. The right believes civilization is a boat floating in a dark sea while left-wingers view history as a process of continual improvement. For business interests, capitalism is a way of creating a fair system that operates independently of a powerful government and personal discretion. For the religious, religion is a way of fighting the inherent sinfulness of the soul, and for militarists, forces a way of stopping evildoers. Right-wingers support the processes that give the status quo stability. In summary, the right-winger believes that the human race is incidental to the world, and that factors like geography, pre-existing systems, and the like are more important than human agency and human goodwill. Right-wingers don't trust experts and academics who they believe to be influenced by their own greedy self-interests, but like people who have done well inside pre-established hierarchies like capitalists inside the market or generals inside the army. Right-wingers hold that culture holds back human nature, while left-wingers find culture oppressive and think that human nature, which is liberated through an impersonal government, will set us free. And I mean, realistically, you do find examples of culture and government both screwing up in their own fields, and so both sides do have a point. Stuff like female genital mutilation in Somalia is undeniably disgusting and evil, and government interventions into society like the Soviet Union or Maoist China are also undeniably evil. Examples of this are views on capitalism and abortion. For the left, capitalism is an oppressive structure that lowers people's goodwill towards each other and replaces it with greed. For a right-winger, without capitalism, people would starve since no one would be personally incentivized to work. Similarly, left-wingers view abortion as oppressive since it lowers women's abilities to choose if they have children, while right-wingers view women as personally incentivized to abort their children, which they view as morally wrong. This is because in a socially conservative worldview, a woman's main role is to be a mother and a housewife, and so abortion is her shirking her cultural and societal role. So far, we've mostly talked about fancy words. Although at this point a significant part of this channel's philosophy, I distrusted philosophy for the longest time given that it seems so disconnected from real-world evidence that whatever the philosopher's self-interest was just became the main theme. However, there are real-world economic and demographic reasons for the modern division between the right and the left. From game theory studies, we've found that there are three main elements in a society. The free riders will continually try to game the system and cheat in order to win, the angels who will continually give into the system, and both of these groups are around 20%. The final 60% are moralists that will either game the system or pay in depending on what everyone else is doing. It's my opinion that the success of a society depends on how it creates incentive structures in order so that people will naturally work with the system or against it. Countries like Sweden or Japan are extremely successful at this, but just look at their crime rates and wealth and the like, while Somalia and Afghanistan are the opposite. Historian Peter Turchin has created algorithms that show historic fluctuations in whether societies are incentivized towards cooperation or tearing themselves apart. From computer models, he's been able to predict when the Russian Revolution or Roman Civil War would occur on the timescales they had occurred at. More horrifyingly, the factors that drove those societies towards disunity are the very same ones we have today. 
The main factors driving these kinds of disunity are a combination of wage stagnation and elite overcompetition. By that, I mean when normal wages stagnate or decline for whatever reason, there's more competition to get into a wealthier and wealthier elite, which is also getting smaller and smaller. This means that there's desperation to get a shrinking amount of good jobs. Whenever this occurs, the elite splits into different factions, whether this was the Armagnacs and Burgundians in medieval France, the Parliamentarians and Royalists in the 17th century England, or the Whites and Reds in 20th century Russia. What all these have in common is they represented different social classes inside their societies that wanted power. Something to keep in mind is that both the right and the left are coalitions of different factions more than they are real central forces. The right's a coalition of business interests who tend to be economically conservative and socially liberal, followed by religious conservatives who are socially conservative and sometimes economically liberal. Then you have militaristic nationalists who tend to be aggressive in America first, and tend to be moderately economically and socially conservative. On the left, you have broadly three factions. First, you have the big government types that want to use government to promulgate mildly socially and economically liberal policies. Meanwhile, you have the social justice far left that's socially left-wing to a near religious degree, while not really thinking about the economy that much. And finally, you have ethnic minorities that tend to be socially conservative but don't want to be culturally dominated by the majority society. In the United States and most of the rest of the Western world, the left is dominated by the educated classes, who will continually support policies to support members of their social class. While on the right, it's the process-driven social classes like businessmen, the military, and the clergy. If you look at left-wing policies, they're all driven by the desire to put people with college degrees in power. Look at social justice, which entails giving professors on topics like gender or racial studies preference over religious groups and ethical questions. Similarly, given college-educated government bureaucrats control over the economy through regulations, college-educated diplomats over the military and foreign policy, college-educated social workers over the police and the like. The left-wing view that humanity is inherently perfectible works very well for the educated classes who believe they've been perfected through education. The open view of humanity that reforms can fix the human condition holds the intellectuals who lead the charge to utopia in a high regard, thus making the view popular with them. The right is based off people who are successful through processes that don't involve education, such as the market, military, and church. The right wants values based off traditionally held Christianity, with wealthy businessmen in charge of policy and the military and police in charge of force. This coalition will support the opposite positions as the left, since it will give them jobs and power as their constituents. It's easy to discount the division between right and left, and many cynical people do do that. However, in real terms, these two offer fundamentally different views of the world that lead to fundamentally different results. Their ideal civilizations are quite different, and in their current state, neither one is any real position to compromise with the other, except if that's an existential threat like China. The depressing thing is that in an open and free society, we need both the right and the left, or people who can see what's vital and works inside the status quo, and those who are capable of seeing ways they can be changed. However, the system we have is in gridlock and not working. Hopefully we can change that. What if Altist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check me out at Patreon, where I've got a couple hundred pages of my cultural history of America and my history of the world. Or alternatively, check out my Instagram or Twitter. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.